Now, personally, I think every anvil should have a dedicated cutoff hardy, at least every anvil you're actually using and working with on a regular basis. And that includes this little Osayo anvil that we got from Vivor. I find that I'm in this little shop a lot more than I thought I would, even though the coal forge isn't set up yet, I'm still in here using this little anvil from Vivor and the little gas forge from Vivor. No, they're not sponsoring this video, but right now these are the tools that make this shop functional. So I thought we would make a little hardy for this anvil today. Now, I thought I had a piece of old car axle that would probably be ideal for doing this, but I couldn't find it around anywhere. I do have some inch and a quarter Flutagon or Atlantic 33. This is a water quenching, non-tempering steel. You forge it, you bring it up to heat, you quench it, and you go to work with it. So this will make a really good hardy, but it is kind of expensive stuff, so you might want to find car axle or a piece of 1045, 4140, something like that. But since I already have this on hand, that's what I'm going to go ahead and use today. And I'll leave some links down below of places who seem to have this in stock right now. Sometimes it's a little hard to keep available. The hardy hole in this anvil is three quarters of an inch. This is inch and a quarter. That will leave us a good quarter inch shoulder all the way around. And that's a pretty good size for an anvil like this. I'm going to try putting some magnets on this anvil, see if that deadens the ring a little bit more. These little anvils really do like to ring a lot. This starts off by drawing out a taper that will eventually fit the hardy hole, and then it will be squared up, and that way it fits down in there. This is probably on the upper limit of what can be forged on this little anvil. You can see how it's jumping and bouncing. That's just energy lost when you're forging it. Any energy making the anvil move is energy that didn't go into the work. On the other hand, this is vastly better than not having an anvil at all, so you just have to put up with whatever it is you have to put up with.
We're getting really close to fitting in there. Now it's time to start establishing a little bit of a shoulder. The goal here is for the hammer edge and the anvil edge to line up with the piece in between to create the shoulder. That's a little bit easier said than done. It takes a lot of practice. Having something like a guillotine tool with butchering dies would really help create that shoulder and make this project easier in the long run. It looks like I finally run out of propane in that 20 pound cylinder using this little single burner forge. Frankly, I'm kind of impressed with how long it lasted. I don't work in here a lot, but I've done a bunch of hooks and bottle openers and little key rings, things like that. Few tools for the demonstrations that we've been using featuring that forge and this anvil, and I just now need to go fill it up. So that's pretty good. Unfortunately, I wanted to get that shank that goes in the hardy hole close to size before I let this piece cool down. So I just ran over to the other shop real quick and I used the forge over there and I have this now reduced to size. It's another 15-20 minutes worth of work. It's a little faster there because I've got a bigger anvil and it doesn't bounce around as much as this one. But it was getting done on this anvil and you can do all this. Now I'm going to let this cool down with the forge. I'm going to see if I have a spare propane tank. I think there might be one with my barbecue grill. And then we'll swap this tank out. Once it's cool, we'll cut it off and we'll finish fitting it to the hardy hole. Right now, it is not an exact fit. doesn't have a clean shoulder on it. If you have a guillotine tool with some butchers in it or some other way to create a clean shoulder at the anvil, that's a great way to go. But I'm assuming most of you don't have that. So we kind of created an ugly shoulder and we're going to upset this down into the hardy hole once we have some more propane. Now this video really isn't part of the affordable blacksmithing series, even though we're using most of those tools. People had asked me, well, why aren't you wearing your leather apron? Well, that was just because it wasn't part of the budget for that series. It is a good idea to have an apron. and If you're looking for one, this comes from April at Forge Aprons. There's a link down in the video description. No, I'm not being sponsored by her either. But if you're looking for an apron, this is a good source. You'll also need to buy more tongs to do something like this. You need tongs that hold this larger material, or you need to be able to weld a stub that you can hold on to with the tongs you have. Luckily, I've got an assortment of tongs, so I was able to find something that works pretty well. If you don't already have one, an angle grinder is an awfully handy thing to have in the shop. It's good for both cutting and grinding, and we're going to use it quite extensively in this project. Now I want to upset this down into the hardy hole. This helps with a really good fit on the shank, as well as creating that nice shoulder. I'm going to try and bevel the top a little bit so that when I start drawing this out I'm less likely to create an overlap or fish lips they're some kind of called. Boy that anvil's moving a lot. This is a 60 kilogram anvil which is 66 pounds and I'm using a 3 kilo hammer which is 6.6 .6 pounds so that's one tenth the weight of the anvil and that's about the upper limit of hammer size to an anvil so so your anvil should always weigh 10 times more than your biggest hammer.
a little bit of straightening on the shank here gets a little bent up as you work on this. I'll start grinding with a hard wheel that'll take the scale off and get the majority of the hammer marks out. This thing doesn't really have to be cleaned up real well. As long as the cutting edge is sharp, that's all that matters. Once that's done, I'll switch to a flap disc. This is a 60 grit flap disc. Then I'll finally finish it up at the end with a 120 grit disc. That's the finest I had on hand. You can go finer if you want. But as I say, it's really not necessary. Function is the number one concern. We'll bring this up to an orange heat and we'll go ahead and quench it. Since Flutagon or Atlantic 33 is not a steel you temper, the final hardness is determined by how hot it is when you quench it. But fits nicely. Now just a little bit of sharpening up. Doesn't have to be razor sharp. It's not a woodworking tool. It's meant for cutting hot steel and it can be fairly dull, just not rounded over. Somebody's going to ask, no, I did not put my touch mark on this. I completely forgot about it. Well, that's a perfectly functional little hardy, and it came out pretty good. Well, the Flutagon is really forgiving for heat treat. You just heat it up, quench it in water, no tempering, nothing else needs to be done with it. It was a little bit stiff to forge, and when I started and I had the low propane tank working on the stem, it was really hard to forge. I was just was not getting the heat. I didn't have enough propane in that tank to get the pressure I needed. After I switched and we went over to the beveled end and I turned the regulator up all the way, this was a lot easier to forge. So if you're having trouble getting the heat, you may just be low on propane, especially if you're working in a little 20 pound cylinder they really don't do the best. A 100-pound cylinder is better, but you can get by in a 20-pound cylinder. Just have a couple of spares on hand. Another alternative to the Flutagon or the Atlantic 33, it's also called, would be something like 1045. That would be easier to forge. It's not as good at holding up to heat, but it's pretty forgiving as far as the heat treat and everything else goes. Also water quenching. It does need to be tempered, however. So it's just a matter of what you can get a hold of and what you're comfortable forging. The Atlantic 33 is really expensive, but I'll leave some links down below if I can find some places that have it in various sizes. It's also a great steel for punches, chisels, things like that.
If you're just setting up shop and you've been working with the basic tools that we've been talking about in some of the past videos, and you're looking to upgrade to the next tool, an angle grinder is a pretty good choice. A battery operated one like this is a pretty expensive purchase. Really nice when you got a shop with no electricity in it like this one is. But if you have electricity or can run an extension cord from the house, something like that, the plug-in grinders are probably a better value. And there's some really affordable plug-in angle grinders. I don't know how long they'll last at a cheaper price, but you can find them sometimes for under $50. Buy an assortment of discs, cut-off discs, grinding discs. I took this down to 120 grit finish with a flap disc, and that's what I used to sharpen it on. Everything you need can be done with an angle grinder for simple projects like this. So it's a handy tool, and we'll talk more about these later. I'm thinking about investing in some of those bargain angle grinders and just seeing how well they work. I don't know that it'd be a very scientific test, but it might be worth presenting and, and seeing a couple of those sub $50 grinders. I just can't decide if I want to spend money on grinders I don't actually need. Till the next time, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop. Make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.